Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Chloe. So hi everybody and welcome from my side as well. As Chloe was introducing me, my name is Heike. And I think before we really start the show here, let's start with a little bit of an active part to get you going. I don't know who of you remembered back in 2006 when we had the World Football Championship in Germany. Who remembers that? I remember that very vividly because we have beautiful weather. We had a great spirit in Germany, a spirit of cohesion, and it was just a super cool experience. But do you also remember anybody who was the most, uh, what, what was the most uh, popular app on the App Store in 2006? Any ideas? Maybe Candy Crush? Something? No? Well, actually, you're right. It is because there was not the most popular app on the App Store because the iPhone hasn't been invented yet. So it was released in 2017, uh, 2017 actually. Uh, actually. So keep that little story in mind um, and we're going to kick off now. So let's kick off with our uh, title of today. So it's a little bit different, sorry Carl from internet retailing, than uh, what was proposed in um, the leaflets. So I'm going to talk about the digital apocalypse and Tom Hanks. So to kick things off I brought along this picture. Maybe one or two of you are well versed in the Bible. I don't know, maybe you recognize those four horsemen. Those are actually the four horsemen of um, Apocalypse. And they actually were there to bring threats and the bad to the world. And they were part of the book of seven uh, seers. So seven seers is maybe a good cue because this book stands for something we cannot really grasp, we are a little afraid of, we don't have a real clue about. And in my industry, so the e-commerce industry, in internet, digital, etc. the four horsemen could be identified as those four men. Maybe you know those four men. So obviously those four men are um, uh, from the four big tech companies, uh, Google, Apple, Facebook and Amazon. So they really try to rule our world and try to go for world domination there. But why do they do that or how do they actually do that? Let's have a quick look at the example of Google then. So who knows what Google is? Anyone? Google? Yeah? What is it? It's a company, yeah. What do they provide? It's a search engine. That is correct. Google is a search engine. But Google, obviously, and I think you're getting my point, is so much more. So Google is also YouTube. Google is also Google Maps. Google is also Google Docs. Google is also Android, so if you're using an Android phone. Google is also everything around Google Analytics. Google is also uh, Google Chrome, for example, and so on and so forth. And in the end, Google is also, yes, we had that, a search engine. Obviously, my point here is that Google um, has its core product, Google the search engine, but there's such a big portfolio and such a big infrastructure around it that Google is um, really diversifying the portfolio, uh, which in the end doesn't necessarily have something to do with its core product. So if we do a little mind game here, please think about what of those apps or which of those apps you have already used just last week or just today. Please take a second to think about what of those apps have you already used. And then multiply this with the entire Western world. And then multiply it over a number of years. And then you might get to a point where you're quite overwhelmed by this gigantic amount of data that Google is collecting of us each and every day. And obviously we're giving we're giving the data for free or we're giving them the data deliberately. So the cue here is obviously big data. And in the end, we come to the conclusion that Google knows ourselves better than we actually do. This is enormous. This is really hard to, to understand. This doesn't necessarily need to be bad. I'm not saying this is bad. It can be very, very good and very, very comfortable. But just to make you aware, aware of the scale of the data that Google, for example, has from us. So, but Google is not alone. So there are also other big, big players, other big platforms. Uh, let's have a quick look at them, what they do. So um, those are the GAFA, the four GAFA um, 
the four GAFA um, uh, companies, that what they really try to do is actually building a wall. So why are they doing that? They really try to build a wall or maybe a firewall between the manufacturers and you guys, the retailers, uh, between you and the customer, the end customer, by having all of those data in there. So please think about it. Who is not to be found on Google? Who is not uh, in the App Store if you're providing apps? Who is not to be found on Facebook, for example, or who uses Facebook apps, who uses WhatsApp, who uses Instagram, all belong to, belonging to Facebook, who does not sell the products on Amazon, in the end, uh, will not pass the gatekeepers of those big tech companies. So they have all the power. So the main reason why they do that, world domination, is obviously to build up a wall between you guys and the customer. But GAFA is not alone, so there are others. There are other more successful or other equally successful um, platforms. So if we have a look very briefly only, so we have the white sharks, the really, really big ones, the ones that are at the top of the food chain. But then we also have the so-called digital swordfishes like the Ubers, the Netflix, the Airbnbs, etc., who have some really great disruptive um, uh, technologies going on. So for example, uh, considering Airbnb, in Paris these days, there are more Airbnb rooms available than there are hotel rooms. So they have some really disruptive effect on this industry in that case. Um, and there are also others that um, kind of were swallowed by a bigger shark. So if you are not keeping the pace and if you are not taking care of being disruptive again and again and keep in mind of what is going on in terms of trends, then you're going to get eaten. For example, Kodak. Kodak used to have a patent on digital uh, photography or digital cameras. But they thought, OK, we have the patent. Let's relax. Let's not mess with our core business at that time. Uh, and let's wait for it. And then others took over. Then we had mobile phones who could suddenly um, do uh, digital photographs. So they kind of missed that, um, that time and then in the end were swallowed also. But then there are also digital piranhas, smaller ones who get cracking already and try to move up the food chain, so to say. But if you consider those, um, those uh, companies you see here, mainly they, uh, those are US companies. Uh, that's quite striking. But we also have companies which have great platforms or incorporate the cap platform um, mentality or idea and have some great um, uh, technologies going in the Asian world, for example. So we have Baidu, the search engine. We have Alibaba as an equivalent to uh, Amazon. And we have Tenzin for social media and apps. So then you might think, OK, we're in Europe. What about Europe? What about the UK then? Huh? OK, let's have a look very, very quickly at the next slide. There you go. So this is a little graph, which is according to um, our friend David Evans. And he kind of um, came to the conclusion that there is an imbalance of the platform economy. So you see most of the platforms we're currently using are kind of dependent on are coming from the US, are driven by US ideas, US innovations. So they make up two thirds of um, the platform economy we have and we are used to today. On the other hand, there's also a quite big part coming from Asia, which, m which might not be that relevant for us right now, but who knows in the future. But you see also a third is coming from here. And then in the end, we have Europe and you think, okay, are we a developing country in terms of digitalization, in terms of digital? What is coming from us? And um, the main conclusion I want you to take away uh, from this slide here is that actually we seem to struggle to incorporate in a, a mentality, a DNA for new technologies and innovation in Europe, which in the end means we make ourselves dependent on the platform and the... the, the um, the players we get uh, served here, and we really need to have them, as I said, because they were established uh, as gatekeepers and we are reliant on them, especially in the Western world. So it's kind of sad that we don't have more diversity here also coming from Europe, for example, for you guys as retailers. Um, so as a result, we are very dependent, as I said. But who is to blame for that? Is it Theresa May? Is it politics? Is, is it Angela Merkel? Well, in the end, to be honest, if we ask ourselves who is to blame, it is actually you. It's you and you and you and also myself. Because if you ask yourself, 
those kind of platforms, those kind of apps and technologies. Who has used them already today? I have. I have sent a WhatsApp. I have took. I asked Google Maps to come. How to come here? I have searched the weather. Or I've looked at the weather for today using Google Search. So actually, it's our own fault that we're so much focused on those big players um, and don't uh, have a more diverse uh, outlook in terms of the platform. So, and those kind of people are really gathering lots of lots of data. And so in the end, the data becomes the new gold, the new oil for us. Um, and it's kind of cool because those people can, uh, those enable them to have great predictions, they become gatekeepers, they can really give customers a specialized um, experience because they know their customers and they have lots of lots of data about them. So having the data means having the power. Um, but it has always been like this, so we can relax. There's always been companies uh, like uh, the GAFA companies who wanted world domination and who had great impact on our daily lives. So I brought along a couple examples of uh, the 80s. So in the 80s, it was IBM, Big Blue. They were meant to be uh, unstoppable, and they really wanted to uh, rule the world, and nobody could pass IBM. And then in the 90s, obviously, we had Microsoft. Microsoft is still doing very well, but in the 90s, they were really invincible, and I thought everyone thought, OK, they will claim world domination, and that's it. So in today, what we end up with today is GAFA, actually. But to be honest, there are lots of experts who say GAFA is going to stick with us for, in, for the rest of our lives, for the lives of our children. But who knows? Maybe tomorrow we have AFA. Or the day after, we might have AFA, whatever it is. So um, experts are really, really um, struggling to say what's, what's tomorrow going to bring. And even the smartest people um, the experts uh, in the past made mistakes. Also, those people are humans and they make uh, mistakes. And I brought along three interesting examples of experts actually making mistakes in terms of predictions. So let's have a look at the first one. The first quote, I leave you with it. Who's having an iPhone? Who's using an iPhone? Yep, so obviously he wasn't right. <laughs> So then in 1901, we had Gottlieb Daimler from uh, Daimler G from Mercedes. He said, the worldwide demand for motor vehicles will not exceed one million simply due to the lack of available chauffeurs. OK, not quite right. We know that as well. And then last but not least, and I think this is the, God, God, thanks God, the biggest um, mistake or the biggest mistake in terms of quote, everything that can be invented has been invented. So that would be a sad story if everything that uh, we know had been already invented in 1901 by uh, Charles Duell, who was the commissioner of the US Patent and Trademark um, Office. So having those four people in mind, um, actually coming back to my first slide, the four horsemen of Armageddon, I think when I think about it again or when I consider it again, actually I would have loved to rather pick that graph. Maybe 50% of the people are now saying, OK, what, what the heck is she talking about? Science fiction, ha ha ha, <coughs> Star Wars, da, 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 da. No, well, I think science fiction is a very, very good topic to talk about because what science fiction actually is, is scientific fiction. So it's all about already now trying to come to grasp with technologies that might be there uh, a couple of years, a couple of decades uh, in the future. And it's really good to use your imagination, science fiction again, uh, to come to terms with those technologies already now. So, and if you concern yourself uh, with uh, future technologies, you quickly come across Gardner. Who in the room knows Gardner? Okay, good. So Gartner is a very big market research uh, company from the States. And in terms of new emerging technologies, they um, have what they call the hype cycle, the Gartner hype cycle, which they publish every year and where you can have a look at new technologies. And a couple of those technologies on those slides, so each and every dot uh, is actually um, uh, a technology. A couple of those technologies have been there on the hype cycle for many, many years. You see it is divided in five stages, and we will take a closer look at it in a, in a bit. And you also see that those dots are along that line in different stages. But let's have a closer look at it again. 
and hopefully the animation works here. So on the um, y-axis, you have attention or expectation. And on the x-axis, you have time, so expectation over time. And then you have actually the hype cycle and the five stage, which in the beginning, you have the innovation trigger. So whenever um, some news is published about a new uh, in innovation, about a new uh, technology, it starts here. And then all of a sudden, it goes up to the peak of inflated expectations. So then it all begins with the buzzword bingo. So you might have heard about blockchain, about I don't know, um, progressive web apps, about all those kind of things, and people get talking about it, but nobody really knows what it actually is. And then uh, there can come the, the stage of a trough of disillusionment. So you really, uh, um, your expectations were too high, you're disappointed, you might be a little, um, you might be a little overwhelmed with it, and then, if you're lucky, you get into the slope of enlightenment, so you get to know a little bit more about that technology. You actually, um, you actually try to understand it more, and you see, okay, there's a value in it, and then, best case, the technology ends up in the plateau of productivity. So those different uh, technologies line up here. So obviously, virtual reality is already kind of in, on the slope of enlightenment shortly before the plateau of productivity and other technologies on the earlier stages. And as I said, so going along that cycle, a couple of the technologies will never, unfortunately, leave the trap of disillusionment, and some only will make it to the plateau of productivity. So that was kind of methodology here. Um, experts, again, those experts, say actually that there will be more new established technologies in the next five years than there have been in the last 50 years. Wow, oh, this is kind of kind of overwhelming, and also the Gartner hype cycle um, confirms this. So a couple or many of the technologies are already here shortly bef before reaching the plateau of productivity. So there's a lot of technology awaiting us, and this is something that can be quite challenging in the end. So too much technology. Oh my God, how are we going to deal with all that? How are we going to? Um, uh, yeah, get to grasp with those uh, technologies. Um, and the, the main challenge here is actually that tech trends are developed exponentially, but our human minds and our thinking is linear. So that's kind of, kind of, there's a discrepancy, right? So lots of technology, but we cannot really come to grasp with it that quickly. And I got a bit of a um, an example about that, um, that, that is supposed to resemble that. So what do we get here? We get a little cell, a little bacterium. And this bacterium doubles in size after one hour. And then it doubles again after two hours. So it quadruples from the original one bacteria. But what do we get after 24 hours only, after one day? Do you have any Im imagination how many bacteria we have after 24 hours? Any guess? Many, I can tell you many. It's 1,677, uh, 16,777,216. So that's, that's just crazy. That's just madness that exceeds our imagination. Another good example of how quickly the technology is adopted is here. So this is actually the St. Peter's Square in Italy for the um, papal election. And that was in 2005. And you see the little friend down here in the right corner. There's just one smartphone trying, or something like a smartphone, uh, trying to take a picture or maybe make a voice message or something like that. And only eight years later, the same picture looks like that. It's just eight years, and technologies have been adapted um, so damn fast and so quickly. So it definitely took longer to go from the horse to the carriage to the Tesla, right? So just eight years. And there's more technology to come. Again, buzzword bingo, I'm sorry for that. So we have big chain block, uh, uh, we have big data, blockchain, quantum computer, at uh, artificial intelligence. And all of those things are already relevant for us today. So even if we cannot imagine that. So if you think about big data, we talked a little bit about Google, but obviously there's also other companies gathering lots of lots of data and interconnect them to make custom tailored um, experiences on their data. 
blockchain, the technology um, that is used as a basis for, for example, um, a bitcoins, uh, and also at artificial intelligence. So, for example, self-driving cars. I'm a keen fan of self-driving cars. So right now you might say, okay, well, ha, self-driving cars, never going to happen. Uh, you might frown upon it, you might laugh, because obviously there had been a couple of um, experiences, but I think it would be really, really great uh, when we have it, because you can work in the car, you can sleep in the car, and in the, in the end, if you think about it, who is actually the ones who is doing or causing the accidents? It's actually the human, isn't it? So it, it can get even secure with self-driving cars. But um, still there are lots of critics today, although uh, especially the GAFA companies invest heavy amounts of money into it. So Google is investing on the Google campus. There are already self-driving cars, Apple, Toyota, and so on and so forth. So lots of things are already going on today as we speak. But again, there are also people always laughing and frowning and ki being kind of skeptical. And that has been like that all the time as well. And it's somehow part of our DNA. So if you have a look at the past, so we have Spinning Jenny. Uh, I don't know if you come across Spinning Jenny. Obviously, Spinning Jenny is not uh, the lady to the right-hand side, but it is a multi-spindle spinning frame. And the cool thing about it is that it could work eight or more spools at once. So at first time, people thought, oh my god, oh my god, this is dangerous. I'm going to lose my job. Um, how will I survive? Oh my god. But in the end, it created more demand because um, more products were able, uh, where we were able to deliver more products with those cool multi-spindle uh, frames. And uh, more people got jobs. So there was no reason to be afraid about that. And another example of that is our friend Badass Edison. So he was the inventor, obviously, of the uh, light bulb. And people said, OK, this is, this is the work of the devil. I'm going to get blind if I look into it. This is not going to happen. Um, let's, let's fight against this. So, uh, and there's another example which I brought along our friend Iron Fist Gutenberg. So he was obviously the inventor of the printing press. Um, and also he got to take a lot of criticism because 93% of the people at that time couldn't even read or there were no reading glasses. Uh, let's not talk about there were no Amazon web shops where you could buy books. So obviously um, when you have new inventions and you have innovations, there's always a bit of panic. And this has always to do with change. Which brings me to the next slide, change management, actually. So there's another graph. Um, and whenever a new change is coming up, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be technology. It can be a new boss or a new process in your company that you have to follow. And you kind of ante anticipate it, you heard about it, you might be worried. OK, we have done it always like that. Do I really have to adapt? And so on. And then it gets announced, and then you fall into shock. Oh my God, don't want to do it. Let's not do it. We have always done it otherwise. You, you fall into de defense, denial, and anger. You get frustrated, and then it's actually introduced. And then, best case, obviously, you have the acceptance of something new, of new technology, new process, new boss, whatever it is. And you start actually becoming open to it, and you become curious. And you say, hey, why not try it out, actually? Why not do it some in the other way? And then in the end, best case, obviously, to, you get to the stage where you integrate it, integrate it in your daily life, integrate Google Maps in your daily life, integrate self-driving cars, for example, in your daily life. And then, obviously, you have uh, a technology which is um, accepted. But what needs to be into, uh, taken into consideration is that especially this um, period here is extremely expensive, right? So we don't want to do it. We don't want to be too concerned, too worried, too frustrated, too shocked about new things. But what I'd really want you to do is actually start with the acceptance, be open, try new things, be open to um, yeah, innovation. And I think this is also what is done so well in the US, for example, with US CEOs, but also with uh, the employees of companies. They are happy to fail. They are happy to try things new things out and if they fall down they pick it up again and they try other things so um, and I think this mentality this DNA is really lacking in Europe 
these days. And this is why digitalization has been quite slow with us. And um, like, if you want to have a look at the um, offices of uh, today's CEOs, you might see someone like this. You see um, someone looking out of the window, not having a lot of imagination and ideas. And actually, uh, the clock shows it's the 11th hour. So it's really, really necessary that you do something and that you open up but it hasn't been like that all of the time. We weren't born like this. So if you remember, a few years ago, you were a couple of years younger maybe, your imagination was a little broader. It's not just looking out of the window, it's really imagining the world out there. It's really about being open towards new things. And even being a child, uh, that was even more. You had ideas, you were willing to try new things, you were willing to fail. And especially as a five-year-old, I think this is kind of the time frame where you are really, really thinking in a broad way, where you have lots of imagination. Especially if you think if you have kids or if you are an uncle or whatever it is and you go to play with your kids in the playground and you, I don't know, uh, somebody wants to try to sell you, a kid wants to sell you um, uh, sand for ice cream, for example. You just have the imagination for it. And I think this is what lacking. And why is it? Because we put on a reality filter. Normal. It happens when we grow up. Why does it happen? Okay, we have laws of nature. I'm not saying, um, I'm not saying there are no laws of nature. Of course, when you step onto a roof and you jump because you're so convinced you can fly, you will break a leg. So there are laws of nature. We cannot deny them. But there's also experience, like learned experience. So once you, I don't know, um, put your hand on, on the oven and it was too hard, you experience that, you learn that you will never do it again. And there's also knowledge. So somebody tells you it's common knowledge, it's common sense, so you believe it and you act according to it. And why do you do it? It's also because of social performance, because you might want to imitate your peer group, you might want to stick to the social conventions, you don't want to fall out of the frame, oh my God, if I do it this way, my neighbor won't invite me to the next barbecue, stuff like that. And in the end, coming back to Europe also is European law, we're very good at law. I'm just saying GDPR, data protection, oh my God. This can, can be a real killer to innovation. Um, but so my, my really plea for you today is really become an explorer, be open, be a discoverer again, right? So let's have a look at the US, let's have a look at Asia, at China, who really, really do it so well. And it's not only about those big companies, it's concerning every one of you. It starts with you and it starts with me. So don't panic and be concerned and be shocked about new things, but embrace them, be open to them. Try to encourage new stuff, also internally at your companies. Try to uh, deliver platforms for your, for your um, colleagues. Even, even the youngest trainees might have the best idea. Ask them, ask them how they use social media today, how they engage with the apps, etc. So we all need to be entrepreneurs again. We need to have more imagination. We need to have more courage also, courage to fail actually. We need more values and in the end, coming to values, we need to have more values and then add values, have added values, have added values for your customers, for your um, customers in your online shop or in uh, offline retail. And from a shopware perspective or from my perspective, there are three pillars which we normally uh, consider when it comes to when it comes to um, uh, values, those are put the customer to the heart of things. This is not something new, you might have heard that before, but it's so crucial to really give an individual uh, experience to your customers. And how can you be in the virtual world? Coming back to data, big data, know what your customer doing and not only know it, don't have only the knowledge about it, but also reflect on why are they doing things so you can really tailor it to your customer. And then the second aspect, use your brain, <laughs> obviously, but it, it stands for automation. So any kind of stupid, repetitive task, you want to get rid of them, try to automize them so you can free up uh, resources to uh, have more time to really focus on the heart of things, the love, the emotion, the experience. So try to 
to really get that uh, resource to put experience, uh, real experiences engaged with your customer in your online shop. Because this is actually what customers want, not only online, but also in the real world, and especially the younger target group, your target group of tomorrow, the generation X and Y, they actually say, 77% 70 of them say actually in the future, due to the fact that so much will take place virtually, experiences in the real world will become all the more valuable. That's an experience. You know where you can also get experience? Schaffingen. I don't know if you've heard. Schaffingen is actually the headquarter of our um, solution shopware. So please come there. It's a great experience, great people, real people. We have um, uh, an open device lab where you can uh, try out the latest devices. So please come and engage. And if you don't want to travel that far, well, how about you come visit us in our office in WeWork in London? So, um, talking about self-promotion, I will stop now, but um, please really soak up the feeling of innovation and of values. And talking of values, we also have values, and I have them here on my shirt as well. So, we really try to be open, authentic, and visionary, and really, really try to be open for new innovations and implement them in, in our platform to have them as a standard ready for you guys. So, but now you maybe reflect, okay, the talk was the d digital apocalypse and Tom Hanks. So what about Tom Hanks? Well, before we have a look at Tom Hanks, please everyone, focus on the screen to get your attention one more time to the screen. Zip. So all forgotten. You have now seen a great talk on digitalization, on digital trends, and you're all very, very much into uh, embracing them. And you're open, you're not concerned, you're open, you're really, really into uh, innovations and trends. But again, coming back to my title, and Tom Hanks, the man himself. So it's freaking awesome, obviously, and Tom Hanks is awesome. Tom Hanks, why Tom Hanks? Well, because Thanks. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>